G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. Welcome, everyone. Today, I'm interviewing Abigail Forsyth from Keep Cup, based in Melbourne, Australia. Thanks for your time today, Abigail. Thank you. Nice to be here, Troy. Let's start with how we know each other. I think Faisal on our team reached out to you guys um, in our search to keep the balance of 50-50 male-female on the podcast. So it's great that uh, you accepted our, our invitation to come on today. I'm looking forward to hearing the, your journey. Pleasure. So tell our audience a bit about your business, what it does and how it makes money. So Keep Cup, um, we are the world's first barista standard reusable cup. Uh, And what that means is my brother and I were running cafes in the late 90s and saw the rise and rise of the disposable cup, knew it wasn't recyclable, uh, knew about the waste that it it was presenting to to us as a business multiplied, you know, across the world and thought we would do something about it. So we designed a reusable cup uh, and have been selling it ever since. I guess it's easy in hindsight, but I would have thought by the late 90s, someone would have already had an initiative like this somewhere in the world. Yes, that was that was one of the when we were thinking about starting the business. So that this was now in two thousand and seven. One of the things we thought was this is so obvious. Yep. Why hasn't someone done this? Like that was almost a fear. Like there must be some basic problem with what we were trying to do. That <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, and what a great place to start, Melbourne. The you know the barista capital of the world, probably. Mm. Yeah. Yes, I mean, we're really fortunate that the growth of the Australian style of drinking coffee in New Zealand as well uh, was being exported all over the world. So, you know, I'd go into a roastery in Sweden and I'd hear an Australian accent out the back. Yeah, Yeah, of course, and London, yeah. 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 And so how, tell us how you started out and what year, was it 2007 was when you actually So 2007 was when we were thinking, gosh, will we, won't we, will we, won't we? And we did. And then 2009, we sold our first products. Yep. Um, and from there it, it took off in Melbourne and, and people responded really well. Like we did a design market in Federation Square and people were saying, I don't even know what this is, but I want one, or this has been, this is my idea. I've been thinking about this. So our timing was, uh, really good. Uh, and then my, my younger brother was traveling in London with his girlfriend at the time. And we said, oh, look, it's going really great. Just started off in London. So wow. started in London in 2010, of course. It was completely different market, completely different um, yep. you know, industry structure. So it, it took a while, but we were there, at, you know, at the, I guess, the ground zero of the London independent scene. So yeah, great. Yeah, I've always loved the brand. I think you nailed it from early on from, and, and the, the design of the product as well is, you know, is, is premium. So I, I could see how it got traction pretty early. Yeah. And so 2010 was the first year for the first sale. Yeah, the first, so June 2009, we um, had the first market where we sold to the public. Yep. But before that, uh, when we did, when we took, had the designs, I went around to a lot of manufacturers and one guy goes, are you crazy? Like, this is a plastic car. <laughs> you know, I've got heaps better designs over there in the corner, million dollar tools and, and the business has failed. So if you can't sell this off the prototype, I'll save you some money. Yeah. And initially I was, you know, I was a bit gutted, <laughs> um, but, you know, picked myself up and, and through the um, cafe business, we had corporate catering. So I called all the corporates we were dealing with, got to the, from the catering to the sustainability who had no budget and no money at the time onto marketing and then, you know, really refined the pitch. And through that, we sold um, 10,000 before we'd even made the tool. Wow. And that was going into corporates, into team members to help with sustainability. Yeah, well, got, we went into, so at the time, NAB was doing their six-star green building at the Docklands. And we said to them, if you, you might be, you know, recycling your grey water and you might have solar panels on the roof, but if you're still serving coffee in disposable cups, there's a real disconnect. Yes. Six star green building message and the way you're asking your staff to behave inside the building. That's a really smart smart strategy. It's a good Trojan horse, get in there and make them help them understand obviously that disconnect. And that's that's a great way to start. So 10,000 sold before you'd even the first one come off the production line. Wow. 
Yeah. And so, and what age were you in? You decided to make the jump out of. I know you're already running cafes, but into this business. Oh, about thirty. I must have been. What am I? I'm fifty now, and the business is thirty-nine. Thirteen, yeah, thirteen years old. Yeah. So forty-seven. Thirty-seven, right. Mm -hmm. And do you have some key numbers you can share illustrate the growth of the business? So we've grown, I guess, probably about 30% year on year on average with a few massive snakes and ladders yep. in that um, story. So the, the first was a ladder and that was when um, War on Waste aired with the ABC. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the phone, the, we cra the website crashed, the phone rang oh. and it just didn't stop ringing. And wow. our, the business, you know, doubled that year. And then uh, COVID and the lockdowns and the business crashed every cat i mean all the cafes are shut no one's allowed to I mean mcdonald's still aren't accepting reusables oh really oh. so yeah. um yes yeah, 70 percent drop in revenue at the start of the pandemic oh geez right and what about number of team members when you started the business out to what you are now so um probably there was probably two of us to start off with mm -hmm. it quickly became about six um and then we're now about 55 Wow, that's phenomenal growth in 13 years. Mm. What about number of countries? Do you know how many countries you're in? Oh, I'd probably say we're in about 60 countries. We've got really? about um, 27 distributors. Yep. Great. Wow. Um, and we're based in, we've got a base in London and a base in Australia. Yep. When was the moment you felt like you'd succeeded? <laughs> I don't know. That sort of, don't you think that keeps, keeps yeah. That, that goalpost always moves. But I think what, look, it's it's still thrilling and probably the first time I saw someone using a keep cup. That, that wasn't I a relative. Yeah, yeah or, or when I, when I also sometimes when I've been using one, someone's looked at me like, oh, good no. on you. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> on. <laughs> That's good. And what does success look like to you? I mean, ultimately, that you know, I started Keep Cup because I wanted to um, rid the world of disposable cups. It's still a world that neither needs, wants, or uses disposable cups. So, it's, success looks like, and you know, closely attached to that is you know, carbon neutral and yep. solving the climate crisis. So, they're issues that I still are still pretty dear to me. And number one thing you'd recommend to marketing a fast-growing business: make a great product. <laughs> <laughs> what about funding the business funding so um because we were running blue bag at the time we had a lot of cash flow so we were able to utilize that we did get a we had the export market development grant we got an innovation grant when we first started we've had a manufacturing grant for our latest product range so it's all grown pretty organically that's great if you were to start up today with plenty of funding would you go into your industry Ooh, that's a that's a really good question. It's it's getting pretty saturated. It's getting pretty crowded in here, which is good because it means that we're we're all thinking about reuse. But no, I think I would try something else. Yep. Can you outline the most stressful point in your small business growth journey so our audience can learn from it? Oh, it's it's all it's all people for me. Uh, whether it's me looking in the mirror, <laughs> going, can I do this? What's next? What's my value to the business? Like, you know, because your value to the company has got to grow with the business. Yep. So that's um, always provides a challenge and, and, and something to think about. And then people, like, you know, the people meet, having your people be able to grow with the business and as the business changes and its needs change, how do you, how do you navigate that? Yeah, it is tough. And as I like to say, I think people are the hardest thing in small business and where the value is at because you obviously can't do it on your yeah. own. And yeah. they're the most rewarding, you know, yeah. the most rewarding that you've shared that journey. You know, there's a quite, you know, three or four people here who've been with Keep Cup from the start and yep. it's so rewarding, you know, mm -hmm. and I don't know where I'd be if they weren't, like, I don't know how I'd feel about coming into work if they weren't here. Yeah. What area in business do you feel you've had to work on the most to add the greatest value? Mm, the people. Yep. So capability, capacity, you know, um, yeah, and, that, and that, that tension between finding the right person who knows what to do because they're an expert in it versus building your people up so that they can take on new responsibilities. 
Yep. I'm guessing these next couple are uh, going to be the same answer. What you've enjoyed the least about managing fast growth <laughs> and love the most. I'm guessing that's people as well. It's probably people. And I think, um, yeah, it is the people. And those, those difficult conversations that, you know, they're the ones that keep me up at night. That's for sure. Yeah, especially in the early days and the business has gone through phenomenal growth and the business has changed so much and the needs of the business on the people working in there. And often I started managing a business about 25 people and they'd been around for 10, 15 years. And clearly some of those managers, air quotes, you know, weren't up for that next chapter of growth. And it's a very difficult decision to have to come to and then execute to, you know, move someone on, especially especially in fast growth. Um, and people just can't keep up with the changes that are needed. And also, you know, it's that all that lag around, you know, you think a project's going to take six months, it takes two years. You think, you know, even we um, moved to bigger a bigger site here and, you know, we were jammed into where we were before and everyone's like, what? Like I could all look, they're all looking at me like, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? You know, people, people underestimate how long things take and I'm probably chief among them. Yep. And what's been the biggest mindset shift for you in your small business growth journey? Oh, probably learning to let go of things. Mm. You know, you, when you start a business and you start a particularly a brand or a, you know, you hang on, you, you hang on so tight to it because it's so, it's so personal and so dear to you to grow it. And then what, and that's initially a real strength of the business being really single-minded, being, you know, driving this thing. And then at a certain stage that becomes an impediment. Because yep. you need to start letting go and giving other people responsibility. So it's really, you know, knowing knowing what you've got to keep hanging on to and what, what you need to let go of and, you know, what you can drop. What was one of the first areas that you let go to someone else? What, what role you kind of carved off your plate? Oh, probably first to go was operations for me. Yeah. Yep. Mm. Um, and the finance. And then sales took a long time for me to let go of that. Yep. And I'm still in there with brand and marketing. Oh, well, as, you, as you should be, most of <laughs> Yeah, that's great. What's the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain? Probably, well, probably to do with that letting go and holding on, really being conscious of, of being conscious of what you're doing there. So you're yep. doing it deliberately and not reflexively. And then I and part of that is just being curious and keeping your head up and 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 um yeah, looking at what's going on around you. And being, I think the other thing is that when we experience phenomenal growth, the business just collapsed in on itself. Mm. So you, you start, you, you, the business is all, it's all internally focused. So yep. um, it's a bit of a discipline to continue to look out. Want to become the best manager you can be? Check out our Kick-Ass Manager course at growasmallbusiness.com. Do the course and add your fellow managers for no extra cost. Join the 30%. 70% of people quit their job because of their manager. Now, I know people is a big, has been a big thread of this conversation. Have you got any advice for those listening on adding people to your team? Any wins, mistakes? Or tips or techniques? Uh, I think it seems really s- simple, but... I think it's about thinking, being really clear about what's capability and what's capacity. Yep. Because mm-hmm. people will always tell you they don't have time, but what is it they don't have time to do? Because we all like to do the jobs we like to do. Yep. Sometimes they don't have time because they either can't, don't want to, um, don't understand the job that's not being done. So, um, you know, applying some critical thinking there can save you a lot of heartache yep. and time. What are some things you recommend to building a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help with that growth? Uh, I think doing something that you believe in and that you are passionate about will 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 naturally build that culture. Because if you're if you're bringing your genuine full self to to whatever it is you do, then you you're um, you know you're leading by example for others to do the same. And is that something you look at for when you're recruiting to to look for that alignment of values? of the business absolutely or and more that you like i guess that the best positive sign for me is if i can have a conversation with someone in a job interview or an early one where we disagree about something but but can sort of build you know you can have a building conversation where you're 
what if we did that or what if we did that? So then you, you know you're going to be able to navigate difficulty with that person. Yep, right. And you, you're one of the founding, one of the early B Corps in Australia, aren't you? Yeah, so we were one of the founding members in 2014. Great. It's a really good cause for the audience. You've got to have a minimum of 80 points when you do your first initial assessment, a maximum 200 points. Um, and it's it's a, an arduous thing to, to get. And I think what you recertify every three years, is it? Uh, yeah, I think it's three now. It used to be two. But yeah, and I think like when we did it, it gave so it gives you so many good um, tools to improve your business's performance, not yep. just environmentally, but for your team, for the community, yep. all those things. Yeah, there's a lot of different factors in there. One of the one of the measurements from memory is something like the lowest paid employee can't be one uh, more than less than one sixth of what the highest paid person in the team. So the the head cheese can't be paid more than six times the the lowest employee, which I think is just a great mechanism to measure. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Anything else on the B Corps you, you want to highlight for the audience? Uh, yeah, I think that um, for us, like having been a B Corp for such a long time, I know it's something the the, employee, the staff are really proud of yep. and, and find engaging. So it's been a, a great tool for recruiting um, great people. And also when we got into Whole Foods in the US, being a B Corp was a clincher. So it's increasingly being seen as something you might need on a product for um, customers to make good choices. So, of course, yeah. Wow, that's great. Whole Foods huge in the US. Mm. Tell our audience how you've handled balance. Oh, sometimes well, sometimes not so well. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, that's a, I think that's a constant thing. And you, mm. your needs, your personal needs keep changing throughout your life and, and the work needs keep changing. And it's just, once again, knowing when to hold on, knowing when to let go, knowing what balls you can. You know, I think part of the thing, you know, I've always been a very hard worker and, you know, I'm, I'll just do this, I'll just work through this and then I'll have a rest. And it's like, yeah. no, there's, there is no point in time where I'll get it every, like the list right. will be empty. So, yeah. you know, it'll all be there when I get back. That's it. But, um, just knowing when you can just, you've just got to, you know, shut the door on things and, and take some time. And that's <laughs> taken me a long time to learn. Yeah, I think that's common for most of us business owners, yeah. Yeah. Out of curiosity, I assume you still don't have a cafe. You're not running cafes on the side. No. no. <laughs> How far in uh, into the Keep Cup journey before you decided to let go of the cafe? Right. I, I was. That was one of the motivations for Keep Cup was getting out of the cafe. <laughs> yeah, I hear it's hard work. Oh, it's such hard work. I mean, I just don't know. I don't know how hospitality have kept their sanity in the last yeah. year, let alone let alone the financial difficulty, but it'd be incredibly stressful. Yeah. How much professional development have you invested in yourself over the years? Not a, not a great deal. <laughs> uh, so books or, you know? Uh, I lo love a good book. I'm a big reader, love yep. a podcast. Um, it's a particularly sort of dry book. I'll, um, I'd like an audio book. And yep go for a walk i just listened to good strategy bad strategy it was like being spoken to by spock from star trek <laughs> for two hours <laughs> haven't haven't read that one yet but i'll put that on the list yeah. have you had mentors or coaches along the way a, a little but not really i mean i've got a good um my my dad ran his own business my two brothers run their own business so i've got a pretty good network yeah. My husband's in has always worked in design and marketing. So I've got a good informal network of confidants. I've got, I mean, a women's um, a group of women who run their own business. So yep. um, oh, yeah. that's good. And you don't have a board of directors or advisors? No. Great. We're on to our final five questions. What do oh you my goodness, we've <laughs> raced through. Yeah. What do you think is the hardest thing in growing small business? Oh, I think the hardest thing is, well, getting a good product that that you can make a living from, and then and then and then I guess hanging on for the ride. Yep. Favorite business book, which has helped you the most? Uh, the book that helped me start the business was a not a business book, but it was it's Collapse by Jared Diamond, and it talks about 
the collapse of civilized, like civilizations in history that have collapsed and often through clinging onto cultural norms that don't do not serve the the civilization anymore. So uh, it's not really a business book, but it, it what what I took from it was it's all about it's all about culture and it's all about the norms you create and, and keep cups, you know, been very successful in challenging some of those norms, which I really enjoyed. Um, and that it's, you know, it's all this too shall pass, I guess. Yep, absolutely. Any great podcasts or online learning tools you use for your own professional development? Uh, I, I do like masters of scale, Reid Hoffman. Yep. He's the founder of LinkedIn, isn't he? Yep. Yep. Right. Haven't read that one. It's on the list. That's a podcast, so he gets lots of good guests. Oh, on. great! Yeah. yeah, one tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business? Excel. Yeah, I love Excel. <laughs> love a good spreadsheet. <laughs> Final, my favorite question: What would you tell yourself on day one of starting out? Oh, just enjoy it. Just enjoy it. It's going to be tough, but you know, remember, you're on here for a short time. Enjoy it. It's all going to be all right. Fantastic. Thanks for your time today, Abigail. I think the audience will get a lot of value out of what you've shared with us. And congratulations on the journey to you and the team. It's been phenomenal growth um, in the last 13 years and you're obviously a very doing a, a great thing out there for the environment and you know the planet. Thanks a lot, Troy. Great talking to you. No worries. That's it. Thanks for listening. Please leave a review in iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. It means more small business owners will find our cast and help people with their business growth journey. 